Mr. Paul Bossi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Mr. Right. Bossi, yeah. how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm I'm really good. I just I literally like ten minutes ago just hit a strip. So um, I'm still on way too much pre workout. <laughs> I'm all ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I, um, I, I just I opened up my email. I'm like, oh shoot, dang! I didn't realize we had a. It's okay. It's okay. Oh man, I just, I'm so amped up. I hit that strict curl PR. Let me tell you, it felt so easy. And it's all thanks to um, Bruce Knox. You know Bruce Knox, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh man, he he totally rearranged my strict curl and it's, it's, it's working so much better. Oh yeah, what'd you, uh, what'd you hit? What'd you PR? <sighs> There's not a lot of weight. You, you're really calling me out here. It's 110 and a half. <laughs> okay, it's all right. Hey, it's a PR. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, 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 anytime you, you hit it, you know what I'm saying? You, you're making progress. So yeah, that's good. You, you're doing something right. Yeah. So basically if I weighed like 80 pounds less, it would be kind of good. <laughs> oh, stop it. You know, people don't realize 110 pound strict curl is, is pretty tough. That's like, that's not a joke. That's a lot of weight. There's not a lot of people that can do that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> <coughs> I want to get in with a little bit with you is history of raw lifting because okay. you're one of the guy, like if I had to think of people to, to, to talk to about this now, mm -hmm. it would really have been um, Al Siegel and you and Al's not around anymore, unfortunately. So I was to, to Jay Siegel, Al's son, and, you know, he was telling me really, you know, there was some raw lifting going on in the 50s and 60s because the equipment really wasn't around, so they really didn't call it raw lifting, but they were lifting raw, but then basically everyone moved into single ply suits, but from, when did it move back to really, like, to <clears throat> it moved back in 1999, when we stopped, we when I formed Raw, is when it it, it kind of that was it. You know, like it was never really a thing. Like I didn't even think of it. You know, when we when we formed Raw, it was like we didn't even form it. It, it was just I don't know. It just kind of happened. You know, kind of happened. Like I remember my first competition that I went to back in the late 80s. You know, I, I go there like I, I didn't even know there was assisted shirts. Like I didn't know that that stuff existed. I'm like, here I am lifting in a, in a singlet, <clears throat> and you know, I didn't. I mean, it wasn't all that great of a lift. I think it was like three fifteen, maybe my first competition ever. And you know, but this other guy has his bench shirt on, and there was a guy selling bench shirts there. And I'm like, so what is that thing you're putting on? You're walking around like Frankenstein, you know? And <clears throat> so that's when, you know, that's when I realized, well, shoot, if it, you know, it gave me like 20 or 30 pounds. I'm like, well, heck, I mean, why not buy it? It'll cost like $35. Like, why not buy it if it's going to give you more, if it's legal, if it's part of lifting? So that's how that all started. Uh, that's how I got into it. Was that, like I said, my first meet, it was I was raw and I didn't know I was raw and everybody else was wearing the shirts. And then as time went on, I didn't. What I did was in 1997, I got a job coaching uh, down in North Carolina at a school. <clears throat> and I did not want my kids in gear, you know, as I knew that, you know, it wasn't a real 400 pound bench or 500 pound bench I was doing. And it wasn't, you know, real squats. <clears throat> and my thing is, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if I'm going to be training my athletes, I want to train my athletes, <clears throat> you know, natural, raw. I want I want them to be strong all through. I don't want them to have weak tendons. I don't want them to have, you know, any weak parts of their body. I want them only to handle weight that they can handle because I don't want to see any injuries. And like I said, like, I don't want, I don't even wear wrist wraps. And I tell the kids, I said, you know, if you use the wrist wraps, it's going to be like a cast here. And then you're not building your, your wrist. You're not building your forearms. You know, <clears throat> some kids want to, you know, that, now these days they want to wear elbow sleeves and stuff. I got guys at my gym wearing elbow sleeves. I'm like, come on. Like, seriously, guys, like, you know, oh, my, they, they want to say their elbows hurt or whatever. I don't know. So, but 
so I started in 1999, just training my kids. When I got this job in Carolina, started training my kids without gear. Like I do not want my kids putting gear on. Period. Well, you and, say kids, you mean like literally, like your kids or your football kids? Yeah, these are my football, my wrestlers, my football players, and then I started a powerlifting team. But my powerlifting team was my football players and my wrestlers. You know, and then there was a few kids that that wanted to join that didn't, you know, they weren't good wrestlers or they weren't good football players. <clears throat> so they wanted to be part of the power lift thing. Oh, they might come up for the wrestling team just because they liked what, what was going on with the power lift and whatnot. So, so I started just training my kids without gear. Like I didn't even know raw or anything like that. I didn't call it raw or, you know, just, just I just don't want you wearing gear. Don't want you wearing gear. You know, when, when you're out of school and everything, you can make your own decisions at that point there. But <clears throat> so in 99, when AAU had split up, that's when we, uh, over the summer, we had the uh, Junior Olympics. <clears throat> and then that's when AAU said that they weren't going to be doing drug testing no more. So we, I was the national youth chairman and different people with different levels of chairmanship to, at that time. And Al Siegel was a big part of it. And <clears throat> everybody just went like this. Everybody just went that way. So me and Sparrowhead went this way and did RAW and Al went that way and did AEDAU and we just kind of did our own thing and um, because we didn't want, you know, the drug testing was important to us. You know, we wanted to keep the integrity <clears throat> drug testing was important, even though like the AAU allowed gear, but we still didn't wear gear in, in AAU with our kids. And then um, just so I don't know, it kind of, it, it, it originally started with raw. Now this is kind of, this is so not what raw is right now, <clears throat> but friend of mine sparrow had uh, you know formed a orig the original raw and it was what it stood for was redeemed amongst the world that's what raw stood for yeah. it wasn't it didn't come out as raw lifting it, came, it that's what it stood for it was more of a christian based powerlifting organization at that at that beginning <clears throat> and then i need to get after two i need to get remember that it was redeemed Remain redeemed amongst the world. <clears throat> That's where the word raw came from. I think like probably five people know that. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not even, maybe, it might even, it may only be mean sparrow only. I don't know. So that was the original name of raw. It was just called, it was called raw. It was actually called raw incorporated. That's what it was called. And uh, so you know, we wanted to, his, his dad was a lawyer and said, you know, you guys need to be incorporated because you get sued or whatnot. <clears throat> so it was redeems amongst the world. And then when I took over in 2002, he went back into the military after 911. It might have been 2001. I think 2002, I took over. He had said, you know, I'm, if you want it, if you want it, you know, you can do it, you can do it on your own, but I, I can't help no more. I can't do anything. <clears throat> and at that point there is when I said, you know, I had to change the name because nobody knew what raw was like, what is raw, you know? And at that point there, we started getting some steam when people say, no, raw is not wearing any equipment. And some people think raw means no steroids. You know, some people still think that. Yeah. And it, it actually just, it kind of grew the word raw that he originally started as redeems amongst the world kind of grew as raw lifting. Everybody thought it was just raw lifting. Yeah. So, and, and then like my email is raw lifting at AOL. So I, you know, I was kind of in the same deal with that. <clears throat> and then when I took over in 2002, I says, I've got to change the name. I got to do something different. And I needed to redo the, the S Corp and make it a new thing. So I changed it to 100% raw powerlifting federation. And because at that point there, I realized that I didn't want nobody wearing gear. You know, I, 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 I wanted people to understand. So at that point there, the name raw kind of came into its own. And people realized that raw lifting was not wearing gear. So you know, it was always, always been no gear, but, but the thing is, like I said, I wanted, nobody knew what raw stood for raw ink. Like if I told you raw ink, what is raw ink? So I could tell you back. I mean, when we started lifting back in like me and my wife in 2001, mm -hmm. we went to a USAPL meet, a, a college team, right? You, you, do you know our coach, Frank Caramico? Frank who? Caramico. No. He's, he's been around since the 70s. He's called lived in, in um, I think, the, what, what's the old organization? ADF? ADFPF? 
Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> I got one of their stickers. I got they used to give patches. I got one around here somewhere. Yeah, I know he's got trophies from that. And um, but anyway, so he he was coaching the college team at St. Francis College. Actually, he was a strength coach and he just it was a club team, the powerlifting team. So basically we we had no money. And so, you know, <clears throat> kids had no money for uh all the equipment. I mean, there were 30 kids on the team. So we, we were going to lift raw and we were all going to lift raw together because we weren't going to have some kids on the team with equipment and some kids with no equipment. Right. And <clears throat> we to a USAPL meet first, because I don't think we, our coach even knew that Al had a raw organization at that time, or you had one. Uh, Cause it probably just started. I think. Right. Right? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Our first meet ever was December of 99. And what happened there was, AAU was supposed to sponsor it. It was supposed to be an AAU meet. It was supposed to be the 1999 AAU World Championships. And the week before the um, championships, AAU says, yeah, we're not going to grant you guys that meet <clears throat> for whatever reason. They wouldn't grant it. So that's when we were in a, a hurry to get this new organization started. So we had no choice. So it was, it was December of 99. I think it might have been like December 2nd or 3rd of 99 is when we, when we, we started it. Yeah, so it was like pretty, well, for like two years after you guys started, when, when we started, when we started in college, and um, we went to a USAPL meet, and we were, we were lifting raw, that's how we were training in the gym, and people thought we were out of our minds. Hmm. People thought, like, people were coming up to us, like, you, this is what a bench shirt is, you need to lift with this, because you're going to get hurt, or you need to wear a squat suit, like, they literally was... They thought we were great. They thought we had no idea about powerlifting. They thought we, we knew nothing. They thought and we were like, nah, man, we're okay. Like, and we had some, we beat, I think, two college teams there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we, we, did, we did really well. <clears throat> yeah. I look at it now when, when you know, they had you brainwashed back then when they say, oh, you wear bench shirts, you don't hurt yourself. Yeah. Now, that's when you do hurt yourself. Yeah. Because guys were doing weight that they can't sustain. Like, let's face it. Your elbows in your wrists are not really made to sustain, you know, eight, nine thousand pound benches. But you put on those bench shirts and everybody's doing, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred pounds. It's like, <clears throat> you know, they want to know why elbows. Are like, what happens when a bench shirt breaks? It rips. Oh, well, yeah. that weight comes crashing down. They tear their pecs. I mean, it's, there's more injury in it. But it's just not real lifting either. You know, it's weird. I remember when we got out of college. Um, I started lifting at this gym it's underneath this pool hall. It, like, it's totally illegal. It shouldn't have been and not zoned to be a gym, you know? But, but like, you know, they had some <clears throat> equipment down there. And uh, who, who was down there? Uh, Pat Susco. Mm -hmm. You know the name? Yep. Yeah, I know Pat. He's, um, you know, he's a guy who lifts. He lifts equipped and he lifts. He's, he uses steroids. But, you know, regardless of all, he's a really nice guy. I he I was a me and I was a guy who was squatting two something at the time and he would strip the bar down and let me work in with him, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, really, really nice guy. Cool. And where the heck was I going with this story? I have no idea where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot where I was going with this story. Um, oh boy. But anyway, uh, anyway, but yeah, me and my wife, yeah, that's how I met my wife on that team. You were, talk, you were talking about <clears throat> the guys that you guys were crazy by lifting raw and everybody else was wearing gear. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, they, they thought we, we were nuts. And then, um, yeah, we found out, uh, you know, we found out about the, uh, you know, ADAU and um, we had no idea about 100% raw. We just... I think uh, our coach knew, knew Al Siegel, I think, from some big meet that they did in Britain one year. And that's how he found out about the ADAU. And um, I guess <coughs> when you guys took over, I don't know, what, what happened with the ADAU? Did they just shut down or you merged with them? No. Over? Okay, so we... We we were growing. We were we were growing pretty big. And ADAU, we had talked in 2007 about joining forces because at one point, you know, I said, well, back back to the other question. 
we in 2002 is when we formed 100 raw power of the federation incorporated so we got away from the raw ink and made it 100 raw power of the federation incorporated <clears throat> so you could put the word federation with it you know powerlifting federation and then 100 raw that people knew that it was all raw there was no shirts allowed yeah. because some people thought that they they thought it was just drugs you know hunt, hunt raw you know raw pure pure muscle raw muscle right. so they thought that you know you could still come there and um, as long as you didn't take drugs, you can come and lift with a shirt and stuff, you know, or knee wraps and whatever. <clears throat> so that's how that all started. Then by 2000, and I know I knew that Al went up there. Was Al wanted us to join him. Al wanted us to be part of the ADAU at the time. And, you know, me and Spiro were like, oh, gosh, they're way up here. You know, we're, we're going to be down here. Let's just do our own thing. And, you know, all right, fine. Let's, you know, we'll do our own thing. <clears throat> so in 2007, me and Al, I had called Al. I'm like, you know, I, I, I've been reading you guys, your rules and everything. You guys are identical to us. Like, yeah. we are so identical. And the weird part is we didn't try to mimic them. You know, we, we did our thing. They did their thing. But we, we had the same values. You know, right. when we all left AAU, and we were all friends in AAU um, back in the day. But when we left, you know, we – we just had the same values, which was kind of strange because we didn't know what they were doing. And I'm sure he didn't know exactly what we were doing, <clears throat> but we ended up being the same exact thing. So I called him. I'm like, you know, we should talk about maybe Jordan forces. I said, because, uh, you know, we're doing the same thing. Strength comes in numbers. <clears throat> You're really powerful in Pennsylvania. I mean, you've, you've got a strong, I couldn't, I had a couple meets in Pennsylvania, but they were small meets. <clears throat> and, um, uh, because everybody was loyal to the ADAU and ADA was strong. They had multiple meet directors in, in PA, but we were all around them. We were in Ohio, uh, New York. We had uh, Maryland, you know, then Virginia, North Carolina. So we were all around him. We were in Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, all New England states. <clears throat> so we ran a meet up in New York and we did a, a, a joint meet together. It was a, in 2007. It was the ADAU 100% Raw. I could pull it up. I could, I could pull up and give you the exact name, but <clears throat> we were in a joint meet where they, everybody joined together. If you had a 100% Raw membership, you were fine. If you had an ADAU membership, you were fine. Um, I don't remember if we made them get the other membership or not to, to do it. I think we just let them use it as you know a one-time day to see how things would go. <clears throat> and Al owns a trophy shop as well as me owning a trophy shop. So Al did the trophies for the full power guys and I did the trophies and the awards for the single lift guys which was the same amount of people on both so it, you know it was pretty equal and we did the same exact awards so both of us were able to you know benefit from it that way as well because both of us <clears throat> you know in the early years if it wasn't for my trophy shop 100% raw wouldn't be here right now I'm going to tell you that right now my trophy shop funded 100% raw to keep the 100% raw going I gave free trophies to a couple of meat directors a few times so they wouldn't cancel meets because they had small turnout. You know, they, some of the first meets we had might've had like nine, nine lifters, 11 lifters, 12 lifters. And they were like, well, I can't make any money on this. I'm like, just run the meet. I will give you the awards free and gave people awards free. <clears throat> Let them run it. Not, not many people, but it happened like three times. Um, so in 2007, we ran that meet together. Me and Al got to really get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about it. And it kind of fizzled out. I didn't hear back from him. So it kind of went away. And then in 2010, I was driving. Uh, Hunter Claypatch was one of my top guys in RAR at the time. And him and I were driving to Florida. And we, uh, 2010 or 11, I think it was right around 10. We were driving to Florida. And um, we're like, you know, I never heard back from Al. We were talking about that meet we had with Al and how it went really good. And Al was a nice guy and all. And, you know, just didn't hear back from him. You know, it's kind of weird to, you know, should have heard back. Let's give him a call. So I called Al. I said, hey, Al, you know, we that meet we ran went really well. Have you ever thought about it anymore? You know, it's been a couple of years. I mean, what do you think? He goes, you know what, Paul? He goes, absolutely. He goes, perfect timing. He goes, I'm a little burnt out right now. <clears throat> and I'm very interested in doing so. I would love for you guys to, uh, you know, I, I would love for us to talk more about this and maybe join forces. What I need you to do is I need you to come to my national championships in P Clearfield PA. And uh, this was that summer. He goes, you know, I'll put you in a hotel room. I need you to present it to my board. 
you know, let them know. I want them to see what you what you're offering, what you you know, what you're all about, what you want to do. <clears throat> I said, okay, that's fine. So, I, and uh, I made plans to come. And I'm not like I said, I don't know if it was a ten or eleven that I came. Well, he died three weeks before I was scheduled to go there. Oh boy! And I was like, oh my god! Like you got to be kidding me! Like first of all, that's like the saddest thing in the world. Like he just just like that. Like you know, here's a guy that that weightlifter has been his whole life. And so he's been in the gym all the time. And the guy, he's probably like, he's one of the most famous powerlifting guys around. Like everybody knows Al Siegel and everybody loved Al. You know, it was like, so I was like, hmm, what do I do? You know, I was like, this was an opportunity for us to come in. But I go, I don't want to go now. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go now because I don't want people to think here I am the vulture coming in for the kill. You know, I'm like, this is, this is just not the right timing. So I didn't make any plans. I'm like, I'm not going. I'm just let it go. Um, his family's going to be mourning, and you know, just just a bad, bad time. And we'll revisit it another year, maybe. Well, then Jay Siegel called me, like two weeks out, one one or two weeks out, <clears throat> and said, "Are you um, you are you still planning on coming?" And I said, "No, nah, Jay, I really didn't want to come. I, I I you know, I'm really sorry about your dad, and I don't want to look like a vulture coming in." for the kill, you know, you guys are down out, your leaders out gone and you guys might be in disarray. And, you know, I don't want to look like I'm coming in for the kill and just look like a you know, dirt bag. He's like, no, no. I, he goes, I, I really want you to really wanted this to happen. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, my dad really wanted this to happen. This is what my dad wanted to do this. So, you know, I'd still appreciate if you'd come, I'll take care of your room, this and the other. I'm like, okay. So I went up there and I presented to the board and we had a good meeting. And uh, the meeting went really well. And we, we, we did a one year, we did a, um, for the rest of that year, we just did some working together on uh, how we would make the rules work. Because we, we had a couple little tweaks, just a couple that were a little bit different. Yeah. And then by one, one thing that sticks out is Jay Siegel's meet, right? Our son mm -hmm. doesn't allow knee wraps. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Um, he's, I think he's going to let him happen this year. Yeah. Cause it's weird. Cause like, you know, like when I read the, through the rule book to be an official and I was like, Hmm, I wonder how Jay gets away with that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah well, it's, it's, each, it's each meet. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's get it. Let me finish off with the L thing and then we'll get in, we'll get into that part. But that, that's a very good, that's a very interesting part of the Federation and the movement of the Federation. Yeah. So so anyways, I went up there for the meeting and then we, we had a really successful meeting and said, okay, for the rest of this year, let's see if we can, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to make the, the move together? So we talked about, you know, um, our national records. The ADAU did not have any world records. They only had national records. So what we did was we took the highest national record um, and whoever had the highest was going to have the new record. <clears throat> you know, so if we want to retire the old records and so if some guy from ADAU had the record at 198 and 220, then he would get the record here. And then we would combine all the records between ADAU and 100% raw for a national. And then for state records, it would be the same thing for Pennsylvania. We had some Pennsylvania records, but not a lot. So if any of our guys had a higher PA records, they would take over the PA record for the Federation. ADAU <clears throat> would archive their records. We archive our records and left them alone. And then we did a one-year pilot for one year. We worked together for one year, ran meets to make sure that everybody, you know, liked the way things were running and that everything was up and up and that nobody was trying to do a power hold and stronghold and using the, their power to, you know, do unethical things. And uh, so we had our, our following meeting a year later. Everything went good. So I think it was 2012 when we made it official. 12 or 13, we made it official. We, we joined forces and the ADAU became part of 100% Raw. We decided to use the 100% raw name because we were a big organization. <clears throat> so we had 100% raw part of the federation, and then underneath the raw, we had the ADAU right underneath the raw, and we kept that for a bunch of years. What do you do? Do you keep that just for like Jay's meets, you know, just like because like it's like you know, a little special thing there? Yeah, we well, we, we didn't want to totally dissolve ADAU <coughs> out of respect for L yeah. and you know, and for all the hard work that everybody did. So over the course of years, we kind of you know kept that ADAU there for a while and just kind of, you know, phased it out a little bit as we went on, you know, it, it's still part of the organization. Um, if, you know, I, I like our American challenge medals, the hundred percent rod have ADAU under, you know, some years we have it, some years we didn't. Um, 
Yeah, I was talking to uh, somebody, uh, a fairly, a, a really good lifter. He had, um, I, when I told him about the ADAU, the Anti-Drugs Athletes United, he was like, oh, that's what that stands for on the bottom of my trophy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it it took me a long time to see what that stood for. Like, I didn't know what it stood for either. It's like it, now when I, you know, where that came from. Al, I, I talked to Al and I asked Al, Al, when did this come up? Like, how did you come up with ADAU? He says I wanted something that was going to be as close as I can get to AAU. So he was really upset with AAU when they decided to start doing drug testing, and he goes, that was the closest I could come up with, you know, to the AAU was be the ADAU. So I'm like, okay, fair enough. So now, now the part about the part about the wrist wraps and the knee in the sleeves. Okay, <clears throat> in order. So you know when we first started, everybody used to make fun of us. Raw, you guys lift raw because you can't compete against anybody else. You guys are weak. You can't compete against anybody else. Blah blah blah. And I'm like, you know what? Whatever. Just say whatever you want to say. You know, most of the guys I I was beating guys raw. It, and they were wearing bench shirts, you know, and I'm beating them by 100 pounds and they're still wearing bench shirts. Like, I just kind of laugh at that stuff, you know. And uh, <clears throat> we, the, the good thing is we started, when we started, yeah, we didn't have the, like, the some of the big, big top lifters. We had some really awesome raw lifters um, up in that Northeast New York area. They had some really good teams. Um, but a lot of ours were, were Guys that just didn't want to buy shirts, that didn't want to get the cuts, you know, when you put those bench shirts on, you tore up your armpits. And, you know, so we had guys that didn't want to spend the money. And we had a, a large youth contingency because I had my high school team. Um, I had left the middle school. So Carl Elliott had the middle school that I had left prior. So he had that in school. And then Sparrow had his high school team. So we would, you know, between those and then he had some, we had some connections with a few, like Hargrave Military Academy and St. Mary's. So we had a lot of school teams involved so we had a lot a lot of youth kids that didn't want to wear gear and then we had a lot of the older master lifters that didn't want to wear gear so that's where our ground roots started <clears throat> and then you know we had our open lifters that you know they they were clean drug free i mean it, and it was an honest drug free thing where a lot of organizations just didn't test it wasn't that they were drug free they just didn't test you yeah. know <clears throat> and people wanted people were just sick and tired of going to a meet and getting blasted out of the water by a guy that was juiced out of his tree, you know, and some of it, some of it's legit. I mean, if you know an organization and I'm not going to call anybody out, I don't do that stuff, but <clears throat> if you know an organization does not test and you're drug free, if you choose to go there, don't sit there and bash them later. That okay. guys were on steroids. Okay. Don't do that okay. because that's their backyard and that's that's where they live okay if you're going to go to a drug free meet that does drug testing and a guy that's juiced out of his street comes here and lists and tries to steal your trophy then yeah you can be upset with that guy you know so <clears throat> that's that's kind of that's kind of where where we got our niche and we started off slow you know some of our first meets only had nine ten lifters in them you know we started off slow like you know when i was running aau meets prior to 99 you know, where you had, you know, guys, well, there was no raw division back then. It was just a weight class. And that was it. So, but you had some guys that would lift raw because they didn't want to buy a shirt. And then you would have some guys with their shirts on. Well, the numbers, heck, my, like my smallest meets were a hundred. I'd never had less than a hundred people at a meet. And then like, here I am going to hundred percent raw meets and, you know, I'm struggling to get, you know, 50 lifters, you know, and some of my, and that's because I have a team. And I have a buddy that has a team. So a lot of our, we had a lot of youth lifters, but as far as adult lifters, we didn't have many adult lifters, you know, because people didn't know about it and they didn't know what a hundred percent raw was. And, but there was so many, so many people were wearing shirts. Like people were not ready to give up the shirt yet. And then as we went on, you know, USAPL used to make fun of us and laugh at us. Oh, you guys wear shirts. We're never, we're not going that way. Now they have, now they have raw meats. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> they, they, they started a, What's that? that? That that pisses me off. Oh yeah, no, that drives me freaking crazy. I'm like, you guys shouldn't be allowed to do that. We should have a patent on on raw. I know, right? That's that's how I kind of felt. I was like, yo, know, they they all left. ADAU at our ADA. A AAU didn't have a raw division. Uh, APA did not have a raw division. Um, WMPF didn't have a raw division, and you know none of them did. USAPL would laugh at us, but yet then USAPL comes that way. So. 
when USAP came, uh, USAPL came out with it in 2006 or seven, I think it was, you know, they started, they had large numbers and they started growing and then raw numbers started growing and growing. And, but see, they were, <clears throat> they were allowing wrist wraps and they were allowing knee sleeves. So lifters were like, well, you know, at least I can wear wrist wraps over here and I can wear sleeves over here. So I, I put it th- at that time, we didn't have Facebook and stuff like that, but we had a forum on our webpage. So on our forum, I put something out there saying, you know, what do you guys think of us, you know, starting to use wrist wraps? Because, you know, wrist wraps don't make you stronger. No. They just, you know what I'm saying? They just, they do, they're a protection. It's about safety equipment. You know, belt is safety equipment. Maybe in the strict curl, it helps a little bit. Because if your arm flops up down a little bit, it's, it's going to cause the bar path to, to be out more. Right, yeah. Maybe in the strict curl. Right. But at that time, we didn't have a strict curl either. Yeah. You know, strict curl didn't come in till 2008. In 2007, we had a regular curl freestanding. And then we got we did away with that. And then 2008, we came on strict curl. So and, and uh, so I put those 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 forums out there and people started joking where well, you might as well call yourself 90 percent raw. And, you know, another guy goes, oh, well, if you're going to do this, you call yourself 85 percent raw. And, you know, like little jokes and schnocks at us, you know, <clears throat> but at that point there. You know, we, we, we didn't do anything. We didn't make any changes. And it wasn't until 2010, we had a team from Russia, 2009 or 10, we had, we had a team from Russia that came to our world championships and um, oh, actually it was the Ukraine. And they had a bunch of guys that refused to lift because we didn't allow um, wrist wraps. Yeah. So they brought like nine, 10 guys and a couple girls and I think seven, eight guys <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, they had literally more than half the team chose not to lift because they weren't allowed wrist wraps or knee sleeves. So the year later, I said, you know what, we'll, you know, we're going to do wrist wraps. You know, we need to do wrist wraps. We're going to allow. It. That was one of the things with us at ADAU at that time when we when we did the formation of the two organizations, we allowed wrist wraps. They didn't allow wrist wraps. Yeah. So that was one of the things like they had to agree to the wrist wraps in order to be part of it. And they were like, you know, they finally agreed <clears throat> that, you know, it wasn't causing that much of a difference. So we allowed the wrist wraps first right around 2011. And it wasn't until just recently, like two years ago, maybe three years ago, I think it was 17, maybe 18. I think it was 18, 18. I think it was 18, 18 to 19 is when we finally decided to go with the knee, wrap, knee sleeves because <clears throat> so many lifters we were losing to USAPL because they were allowing knee sleeves. And it was like, guys, listen, I know that you're not real happy about this decision, but if we want to continue to grow, we're going to have to change with times. Okay. We're still going to be raw. I mean, every other organization now means down now, other people are carrying raw divisions and they're all allowing knee sleeves and they're all allowing wrist wraps. Like, you know, we can still be a hundred percent raw, but our numbers are going to be small and we're not going to grow. Right. And everybody's going to, everybody's going to pass us by. We so the only thing we can do. So- people are a lot of, we, we were a crazy bunch and we would rather like squat with like five people with no knee wraps on, you know, that, that, that was how I, I don't think, I would say that's probably how your experience went with them. Well, <clears throat> what we did is we, we, we came to a, a decision and an agreement that we said, we're going to do one year pilot and we're going to keep anybody that wants to use knee sleeves can use knee sleeves and we're going to have a um, separate records for them. Okay. So we're going to duplicate the hundred percent raw records. Yeah. And so we're going to have two sets of records. If you're going to lift with sleeves, these, you're still going to have to break these records over here. Okay. And by breaking these records, you know, then that will be the, the, the sleeve records, people that are using the sleeves, the hundred percent raw records are for all the people not lifting with sleeves and the ones over here, that's, that's what your goal is. Like, you know, we're not going to start new records. Right. We're not going to sit there and say, you know, everybody's got a new record. I, that drives me nuts. I, that was one of the worst things that I hated when we started coming to raw, everybody was having records and I hate that, you know? <clears throat> so I'm like, no, we're not getting rid of this. That's going to be the standard. If you want to break it with your knee sleeves, you got to break that old record. So we had two sets of records at the end of the year. We did a whole year pilot. And Jay didn't do knee sleeves. Jay, you know, he chose, no, I'm not using them. I, you know, people want to lift and lift totally around. I'm like, that's fine. I mean, if, if you don't want, you know, it's if lifters agree to that, that's fine. They go over there. If they don't want to do it, then they don't go to his meet and they go to a different guy's meet. 
well, Jay, that's the way his dad would have done it. You know, that's that's why yeah. he wanted to right. Die, you know, exactly, yeah. exactly. I agree. Al, Al would have done the same thing. Um, and Al might have been real angry if I had proposed that after we merged together, you know. But yeah. like I said, we, if we want to continue to grow, we were going to have to change a little bit with the times. So <clears throat> we did. We agreed on a one-year pilot to see how much difference they were. At the end of one year, only three records were broken because of sleeves. Yeah, knee sleeves. You know, only three. You know what they are. <clears throat> I think they're more, I, I call it the Superman effect. Uh, you know, you put the cape on and now you're yeah. confident, you know, yeah. like my sister-in-law, hey, we go. if you go on her Instagram, watch her squats before she was wearing the knee sleeves recently. Very slow, you know, rebound, you know, out of the hole. You know, she got, almost looked like a pause squat. <clears throat> she got the knee sleeves and bam, she's fast out of the hole. And I'm like, that's, that's not, it's not the knee sleeves. It's just, it's all. Confidence right here. It's psychological confidence. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. They feel, yeah. No, the knee sleeves are doing. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we, we did it for a year and only three records were broken. One open record was broken and the other two were master records. Okay. One was 55 to 59 lifter and one was a 60 to 64 lifter. Now, those two lifters, the 55 to 59, he broke his own record by only five kilos, okay? His own record. So it wasn't like he was breaking some other guy's record. He broke his own record, which is not unrealistic. Right. You know, you own the record, and right. for you to break your record by two and a half kilos, which actually was five kilos, it was five. He broke his own record by five kilos. That's not an unrealistic, you know, goal, uh, and then the other lifter was the 60 to 64 who broke his own record by two and a half kilos, which is five and a half pounds, which is still not an unreal unrealistic, you know, achievement, you know, now the third lifter that broke it actually broke an open world record and our open world records are really high. Like some of our open world records are still from the early 2000s with, um, I can't think of that group that was in New York, but there was a really strong team out of New York and, um, uh, Gosh, I can't think of their name right now. But anyways, so the third record was was broken, was an open world record broken in the 165 class, but it was broken by probably, this, this guy is probably the greatest drug-free raw lifter in history, okay? Uh, Anthony Conyers. I mean, he is a super freak, superman, you know, like this is, you know, this guy is like a god in lifting. I mean, this <clears throat> this guy is amazing. I don't know if you're familiar with Anthony Conyers, Tony yeah. Conyers. Oh my gosh, Tony Conyers owns every world record there is. Okay, he's 60 years old. And a couple of years ago, when we had our world championships in Virginia Beach, and we had you know we had 15 different countries there. We had Ireland and uh, India, and uh, you see Ukraine was there, uh, Australia, China. Uh, Nauru, that country, Nauru, who that won the world championship, they won the whole team division. I mean, we had the best, we had Canada, we had the best competition we've ever, ever had. That was the year before, uh, two years before the COVID hit. <clears throat> and Anthony Conyers, not only did he crush the class, but he also wins the best lifter at 60 years old. Okay. He does, at 60 years old, he does a, I want to say 515, 530 squat, 600 plus deadlift. And like a 365 or 375 bench at 60 years old, 165 raw drug free. Yeah. You know, lately there's been a lot of older guys smashing some heavyweights and tell you the truth. It really frustrates me because when I was a new lifter back in like 2001, there were really weren't that many older guys lifting much. And yeah. I'm like, you know, if I just keep chugging along when I'm 70 or 80 years old, this will be a pretty good spot. <laughs> and now these guys that are squatting 600 pounds at 70 years old, I'm like, that's it. I'll, I'll never be a good lifter. <laughs> yeah, this uh, it, it, Tony Conyers is, is just is one of a kind. Like he is one of a kind. When you know, we we've drug tested him multiple, multiple times. Like he always gets drug tested because he, his numbers are just like so extraordinary, you know. And we've even used it, use the um you know, we usually use uh, Redwood as our lab, and uh, but we at the Worlds a couple of years ago, we actually brought in water drug tested. We flew in a water uh, rep from Australia, yeah. 
that did the water drug testing. So it was all, you know, third party and right through that test too, you know? So, I mean, the guy is truly, honestly, drug free yeah. and he's raw and he's just Superman. Yeah, the ADAU and you guys are the same with the drug test, and you test like you know the right people. You know, you test yeah. the people, the best lifters, the record holders, the the you know. You, you go to some other kind of organizations that say they're drug testing, and they're just randomly drug testing people. And I'm like, that's <coughs> ridiculous. I'm like, that's w- w- why would you not test the guy that 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 broke a record? And, and that that's a great point. That word, there's one word you just said randomly okay it's like there ain't nothing random about a freaking drug test okay right. listen i don't give two craps about this guy that's seven years old that's bet you know in the 220 weight class benching 110 pounds right. okay why are you drug testing him or drug testing a nine-year-old kid that's you know benching 65 pounds or squatting you know 100 pounds it's it's we let's i tell people right off the get because you know all these other organizations that say they drug test that ones that try to drug test you know we do random drug testing yeah Yeah. you know why because they want their numbers up here yeah and they want to show you know we have all these numbers and we're clean and nobody tests positive so they test okay i'm testing this guy i'm gonna test mike because i know mike's clean i'm gonna test paul because i know paul's clean i'm not gonna test this one here because i know he might pop the test and i want him to keep coming back i've seen i've seen you when, when you've been around lifting for a certain amount of time, you know automatically who's using steroids. Automatically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, well, that, <clears throat> I, always, I always tell my wife, like, every time I go to a meet, like, like, my biggest goal is to get drug tested. That means you're doing something. I know. <laughs> it, it's an honor. You know, when I used to get, back in the early 90s when I was with the WMPF, I did five meets in six weeks. I was just like, I was so addicted to it. You know, I lived in, I lived in uh, Massachusetts and, you know, they had a, a meet each week in a different state. So this week was in Mass. Next week it's in New Hampshire. Next week is in Maine. Next week is in Vermont, and Rhode Island, Connecticut. And it's like, everything's within an hour. You know, nothing was, nothing was further than an hour and a half from me, you know, down here in Carolina, I can't even get to Raleigh within three and a half hours, you know? So it's, it was, I just did a lot of meets. I got drug tested at all five of the meets. I'm like, you know, not for nothing, but I, I was clean at the meet. You tested me five weeks ago. I was clean four weeks ago. I was clean three weeks ago. I was clean two weeks ago. I'm doing the same daggone weight all five meets. Yeah. Seriously? Like, you can't, like, test somebody else. At, at that point, this, I get a little frustrated, you know? But it, it was it's an honor. It's an honor to get tested. I tell people when they come to our meets, Yes, we do drug testing, and it's, it's selective drug testing. Yeah. We are going to choose the top lifters, and we're going to choose the, the big list. You know, and you might be second place, but you know, and if you have the look, if you got the look, you're going to get tested. And you know, we minimum is ten percent, but I, you know, we'll go above and beyond that. I tell my meat directors, I'm like, listen, if you, you know, and I, I don't want meat directors to to get crushed with with drug testing fees. And I'll tell them, I'll say, listen, you know, you got, you got a small meet, whatever. If you think that there's like two more guys that you need to test, go ahead and test them and I'll cover it. You know, I'll pay for it. You don't even have to worry about it, you know? Um, so if, if, you know, you, you meet your 10%, but after that 10%, if you want to go above and beyond, because you just know, and you know, what's funny is every once in a while, you know, we'll have some really stud lifters come in and we have to test these guys. You know, you got guys breaking world records and we have an automatic, if you break a world record, you're automatically tested. Boom, done. You know, doesn't matter. You have to test it. So if you got if you got ten guys breaking world records, and all ten guys are getting tested, um, and then so you you might have a guy who's on that has that look, but didn't hit very good numbers. So you are like, well, you know what? His numbers are terrible. He didn't do much, I and mean, maybe he just has a look. We'll let him slide this time. He didn't. He's like third place or whatever. Who cares, right? Let's let's. We have to test these ones here. And then all of a sudden you come back, they think, oh, wow, I got away with it. They ain't going to test me, right? Blah, blah, blah. And they come back next time. We get them on the next one. So, yeah. You know, it's funny. I talk to guys around the world on, and uh, they ask me what organization I lift in. And I tell them I lift in 100% raw. And they, they go, no, I know you're lifting raw, but what organization are you lifting in? <laughs> you know, yeah. Get a little confused. But guys, like, I seen I seen pictures of guys posting a hundred percent raw in Ireland, but mm. I talk to guys in Ireland and they don't know really about the strict curl, but they they get super. Basically, anyone around the this United States, anywhere you talk to, a lot of people have heard about it, and when I tell explain it to them, 
they are so amped. They're like, they want to find a, a, a competition that has it. People really are, that don't even know about it, are very interested and really want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. The, the strict curl is growing. It, the strict curl is blowing out of the water, you know? And, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the hottest lift we have. It's, it's the most, it's the biggest lift we have. It's like, it started as just do a curl at the end of the meet while the meet director is putting together the results that you would, you know, have a little strict curl on the side, you, know, you get five, six, seven lifters. It's a little bit e- extra revenue for the meat director he, that he could pay his helper, his all staff and spotters and loaders. It's a few extra bucks, you know, it takes maybe 15 minutes. You know, you might, might have 10 tops. And then, you know, you, in the meanwhile, you're putting together all your results and getting everything all set. That's what it started as. And now it's like the biggest lift we have. I mean, at the world's, you know, we, we get 125, 130, 140 lifters for the strict curl every year now. And, you know, just, it's that big. I mean, it's got its own day. It used to be, it was like a, you know, nighttime thing. Now it's got its own day. I mean, it's just, it's that big. You know what else? I mean, I, I, I really, I talk to a lot of people on this, this podcast from all over the country and all over the world. And I mentioned that there's some, I've heard of some, that there's meat organizers I've heard in Canada doing an overhead press. Yeah. And the second I mentioned that, there's a twinkle in their eye. And they're like, really? Like, everyone seemed, is like super excited about so that. So, Herb had started that back around 2012, 13. He started doing the overhead press. And, you know, it, it's a hard one. It's a hard lift. And, uh, you know, again, it's one of those lifts that you start a little side thing. And a few people do it. And not everybody likes to do it. So we actually just tried talking about it and bringing it up just recently within the last five months or so. We talked about it and we put something on Facebook about it. And we had some lifters that wanted to try it. Uh, Herb's already got the rules written up and all. And, uh, th- th- you know, you got some people that want, some people that don't want. You know, it's like, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if a lifter doesn't want. It really comes down to does the meat director want to do it. Right. You know, the extra work is you got to get, you know, extra equipment and the way herb has it set up it's, it's a little bit different than i would like to do it he's got it set up as you come off the racks and you know get set and then it's just it's real strict and straight up yeah. where i would prefer to see the guy sitting down in a shoulder rack you know and with a bench behind him and just go straight up you know you can probably convert and make your uh strict curl platform possibly to work for it you know there's there's ways to do it. we talked about it uh there was some pros and some cons there was a little bit of arguing on on the facebook page we actually had to stop it we had to pull it down the um the article because it was like it started getting you know some people getting upset about it um <clears throat> so it's one of those things that if we're going to do it we'll be like you know we're gonna do it as a pilot and try it you know a couple of meet directors can try it if they want it doesn't mean that every meat director would do it if we bring it in. Yeah. You know, they're not all going to do it. Um, some may do it and some might not do it. The problem is, the other problem is, some of these polythene meats last a long time. Yeah. You know, and people don't want to sit there. I mean, it's hard to keep somebody's attention for eight hours. And the last thing they want to see is, that's why we do like the curls the night before. Yeah, the reason. I think it would definitely have to be like a Friday night thing, a curl and overhead press on Friday. Yeah. And then yeah. Our Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, once once you see a deadlift being done, the last thing you want to do is come back like with, with a curl yeah. on overhead press. You know, you got Mike Eaton coming up there, attempted a 900 pound deadlift, you know, raw and drug free. And then all of a sudden, you know, the place is going nuts for 900 pound. And then you got right after that, you got some, you know, kid curling. 15 pounds, yeah. you know, just, just a bar. It's like, you go from all this hype and all this, you want people leaving that venue, like, wow, did you see, you want all that energy, like, dude, can you believe that guy at the end, there? how much he did? Yeah, I could see Friday night turning into an odd lift night, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, call it an odd lift night, you can do it if you yeah. want to do it, you don't have to do it if you don't want to do it, and then, like, the, exactly. like, the full power meets on Sunday, or oh, Saturday, yeah. different day. Now, now, the cool thing is, the way Herb has it set up, is he uses the ER rack. So it's already set up for the Saturday. You know what I'm saying? So he puts it on the rack, comes out right here on the rack, come back right here, press. You know, so 
it it could be done. It could definitely be done. Um, it, it, like I said, we've been talking about it, and you know, it, like I said, we, with COVID and things, things have, things have been really messed up with COVID, and we haven't made too much progress in the last year. Um, just struggling to put any meats on at all in the last year. And people, you know, worrying about their meats getting shut down. Yeah, I think we finally got the COVID thing under control. And I think we're finally going in the right direction that people could run meats and, and realize, like, you know, okay, my meat's not going to get canceled. You know, because we had some spiking happening. And again, and but now I think we're finally on the downswing and people, you know, we can start to get back to business normal, talk a little bit more about that overhead press. And maybe in 2022, maybe possibly, you know, start doing it as a pilot in some different uh, smaller meets. Paul, can I pause for one second? Yeah. 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 All right. So you're talking about uh, COVID and everything's starting to get normal again. Right. Yeah. We're getting back on the back on the track, and looks like everybody's having their American Challenge this year, so that's good. Yeah, I went to a competition. Me and my wife. I'm not going to say where it was and who gave the competition, but the f- first. The night of the meet, the weigh-ins, everything was allowed to be going on. And then the governor of that state shut it down for the next day. You know you know which one I'm talking about? No, I don't. No, you know? <laughs> and the meet was not supposed to happen. And it was all a wink and a nod between everyone. It uh, happened somewhere in the middle of Pennsylvania. Okay. That <laughs> pretty much, okay. you'll, you'll yeah. know. And, yeah, I know. Uh, that meat director had a lot of balls. <laughs> we did we did that all under the under secret. Uh, all the windows were closed. <laughs> wow, poor guy. That, that's a lot of stress. That that that's that, you know that sucks because you, you got all these people here. You know they paid their money to lift, and you know and, and I mean and it's not about the money, but like these lifters have trained for this, and they're looking forward to this is their outlet. And then the meat director puts all this effort, time, and effort into it and money into to running the meat and stuff. And that's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of work to put a meat on. And then all of a sudden you can do it Friday, but you can't do it Saturday. Yeah. Come on. You know, why not, why not make it Monday? Sunday's the end of the week, make it Monday, you know, and give enough notice. Don't, don't come in on Friday and sit there and say, you can't do nothing Saturday. They did that with the NCAA wrestling a year ago. Yeah. Um, the NCAA wrestling, they said they were supposed to start, Thursday and but Saturday everything was being shut down like no, nothing could happen on Saturday it's like well you know nothing nothing but they should have they, they should, NCAA should have ran it Friday and Saturday I mean Thursday Friday and got it done with if, they, if they're worried about it or they should have talked to the governor or the you know whoever and say can we get you know exception but if not move it all up a day or just knock it on those two days you know make it up those poor guys that trained their whole life to be an NCAA champion and some of those guys would deny that opportunity, you know, just because of one person's decision. Like one day is not going to make a difference, yeah. you know. All right, so you coach, you've been coaching powerlifting a while, right? Yeah, shoot, since 1992. Okay, so have you had the same exact training method since 1992? Or has things, have you, have you evolved and changed Thanks. It's funny. It's funny you say that because I, yeah, you know, I teach strength class. I'm a, I'm a head football coach at a high school, and I have, a, I have strength classes that is part of our curriculum. It's a strength class, weight training, and we were just talking about this last week before the break, and um, told the, you know, the kids, my, my training. I'm a student of the game. I'm always trying to get better, you know. And right now, I think I have an amazing routine that I use with my kids, but it's definitely better than what it was two years ago which is way better than it was five years ago. And I thought five years ago was like, I was the you know cat's ass and, you know, better than anything it was. And then I look back at like 2005, what I did then, I'm like, damn, man, like, I, I, that was nothing. Then I look back at what I did back in 1992, 93, you know, yeah, I got results and I got those kids in the power lifting and they lifted on, but it's like, that was terrible. Like what I did then, like, so I'm constantly evolving, constantly picking things and, you know, like, heck, the other day I'm in my gym working out, doing, doing some cardio, and I'm watching somebody do something. I'm like, I'm going to start doing that with my kids. You know, so cardio. I'm always, you know, always learning, you know, always constantly learning something new and try. Now, there's things that I try to do. You know, you, you read or see videos or you see somebody in a presentation talking about something or doing a webinar or whatever. And then, then all of a sudden you're like, you say, okay, I'm going to try this. And then, you know, there's been times where my kids have gone backwards. 
So yeah. I'm like, yeah, that, that, this ain't this ain't gonna work, you know. And also, I'm smart enough to understand, which, I, you know, a lot of people you could you'll relate to this, but when you see things in magazines, you know, and I've been in a, I've been in a, a I guess I've been in my fair share. How many guys are in the magazines that you see, you know, whether it's Muscle and Fitness, whether it's uh, Iron Man, you know, Pilots in USA back in the day, how many guys were drug free guys? Probably zero. Not very many, if any, right? Yeah. And so, the, you know, most those a lot of those guys, yeah, they're big and they're strong. So, because they're big and they're strong, people think they know what they're doing. That's not always the truth, okay? Yeah. yeah their coach might yeah. know what they're doing, and they know what they're doing because they're taking drugs. Like, so they 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 took the right drugs. So when I when when I have kids tell me, you know, well, coach, I'm, I'm going to try this routine. I'm like, what are you, a freaking idiot? And I'm not going to mention names. As like I said, I don't do that. I don't call anybody out. But like certain people's routines, like you know, they're on drugs. Yeah. Your body is not going to recover the way somebody on drugs is going to recover. You know, unless you want to get into that stuff, then then you can follow that routine. But you're going to overtrain because you're not going to have that chemical assistance to recover your body in time. I, I, yeah, I, I kind of just had this argument with my my sister in law last week. She's she's, I mean, she's been powerlifting for two years, and to me, that's brand new, you know. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. And she all of a sudden she's like, you know, I'm gonna start this squat three times a week, and I'm like, I I think that's a lot, Haley. You know, like I think you know you know two times a week is is good. You know, you know. I, you know, me myself, I'm doing, I'm, I, I'm getting old, older now. Like recovery is tough. Like between the squat and the deadlift, I'm only squatting once a week. You know, when I do my heavy squat and my, you know, my down sets and stuff and on my, on my squat, I, I just do it all in one day. But I'm like, Haley Joe, three times a week. I'm like, I know she's only like she's 25, but I'm like, I'm like, she, and she's like, no, I can do it. I see other people doing it. And I'm like, all right, she's not going to listen. I said, all right, well, we'll see how it works. <laughs> I don't think it's going to turn out good. You know, I, 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 I try to explain to my kids about the, you know, the guys in the magazines and, you know, I'm like, guys, there's not very many guys, you know, out there that do it. I mean, I, you know, you, you just don't see it. They, drug-free guys don't typically lift a lot of weight and they're not, their characters are different than, you know, than the guys that were walking out and just muscles on top of muscles and veins on top of veins and boom, you know, like I, I've been pretty fortunate. I've been, I've been in a, my fair share. I was in muscle and brawn. I was in power, uh, obviously the power of the USA magazine a bunch of times. I got some, they, they did some good articles on me in there. I was in the uh, Iron Man magazine, which that was a really nice one. I, I did my reverse pyramid routine that I started. I produced that in 1994, that reverse pyramid, which I still use it to this day. I've tweaked it a little bit. Um, uh, gosh, Critical Bench did a nice article. That was that's an online uh, thing. I don't even know if they're still around, but Critical Bench used to be a big thing back in the day. They sponsored some of our meets. I did one with them as well. So I, I try to explain to my kids like you're not gonna find it. You know, and then Tim Henriquez that came out with that book all about powerlifting, yeah, which is awesome because Tim Henriquez being a he's a he's a, a certified trainer, you know, with the NTPI, MPTI. And um, MPTA, yeah, okay. I'll make sure I get it right. But then he's, um, you know, he's a powerlifter as well. He's a drug-free powerlifter, and he coaches a team as well. And Tim had spent a bunch of years doing, you know, articles. And I mean, I don't know if you've seen it, but his book is like this thick, yeah. okay. And it's, it's and the name of the book is all about powerlifting. We have a link on our website, and um, it's it's amazing. Like he's got all it's it's all 100% raw lifters in there adau lifters in there and um you know he's got a couple others might have been sprinkled in there that he he went to but i don't i'm, I'm pretty sure everybody in there is a drug-free lifter i'm pretty sure and, and and it's got great articles and it's just like people are being honest on what they do dennis cherry's in there you know who's probably the greatest pound for pound drug-free bencher in the world ever you 100 percent row you guys always in kilos competitions no no we went to kilos in 2007 that was that was again one of those things that bring us to that next level you know we had uh we had been pounds up into that so if you look at some of our records some of our records might be like really off might you might say you know 
122.7 kilos. You know, and you're like, wait a minute, how the heck are you going to make that? Well, that's because, you know, it might have been, you know, 250 pounds or 240, you know, five pounds or whatever, and it ends up being that particular kilo. Um, so, yeah, we, we were, and we still allow pounds in sanction one events, but in order to, that, that's the only state records only. Because, you know, we're trying to recruit chairman and like Brian that you have just, you know, turned on to us and Brian's going to run meets, he doesn't have kilos. So if Brian runs a meet with his pounds, then he can run the meet with pounds, but it's going to have to be state records only. In order to break national and world records, they have to be kilos because kilos, the kilos are, are sort of have to be calibrated kilos, not just kilos, but calibrated kilos in order to, to break national world records or to have a level two or a level three event. And we started that back in 2007. Yeah, at the bear. <laughs> you got to watch him lift. He gets so amped up. If you get in his way, he's just going <laughs> to, he's just going to steamroll you. Yeah. He goes, I appreciate. I appreciate. Okay. Yeah, he goes into another dimension. The bear, he's crazy. I appreciate you sending him my way. He, uh, he, we've been talking. He's, he seems like I feel like I've known him forever now. You know, like he's really personable guy and really cool guy. I mean, he's down to earth. I like him a lot, and I like what he stands for. He's, he's a perfect fit for for him set raw. He's been a, a drug, well, a steroid free lifter since uh, nineteen. 1974 you know oh, wow. uh and he started lifting on my coach's team in 1978 and uh i mean really anyone that i know who power lifts who's drug free like and you feel like you know them you we, we all know each other you know we just yeah. have the same personality the same mindset if we're doing it mm -hmm. you know that's that's what i found I, and I, I talk to people from different countries. I, I have a friend in Iraq now in Baghdad who is a power lifter and like, we're like best buddies, like in like, you know, it, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, yeah, power lifting's and I don't know if, but I have no idea if baseball is like that or what, I, I don't know, but I know, I, I think power lifting's different. I think you need a certain mentality to really to, to do this sport. Well, I, I want to, I want to go one step further. Yes, you're right, but I think it's more with the drug-free powerlifting rather than the non-tested right. powerlifting. Because, right. like, you know, when when I go to my, my drug-free meets, like, all over the world, you know, I've been to Ukraine, I've been to India, I've been to Australia, Belgium, uh, Italy, gosh, the list goes Ireland, it just goes on and on and on. But everybody, because I only do the drug-free meets, next thing you know, you got hundreds of friend requests, you know, from people in that. And, like, and, they, and we still, you know, touch base and talk and you know those guys i was gonna meet belgium 2008 and i still hear from the guys like, hey remember me yes i do you know you know it's like wow you know it's 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 so different it's it's, it's the friendships and then the pictures people want to take pictures with each other you know with their like one of my favorite pictures is back in 2007 i went to italy for the world championships with a, i'm not going to mention the organization because i don't like giving certain organizations any credit but I was, you know, a member of Team USA and um, went over there and like my dad had come and being that I'm Italian and being, you know, my family was from Italy, but me and my dad never been there. Like, this is like, um, this is like the most, this was my pinnacle of my powerlifting career. You know, this was the pinnacle. This was like, it really did not get any better than that. You know, I went there, I competed in Italy. I won the world championship. I was the only American that year to get a gold medal and I won best lifter as well. So that was really, really cool uh, to win the best lifter. Of course, I forgot to plug my laptop in it. Gotcha. Hold on. Um, Tommy, hold on. One second. It's not a bad basement gym, right? <laughs> That's a pretty cool gym you got there, though. Yeah, and right behind you, I got a, uh, a re reverse hyperextension. Oh, yeah. Nice. I just want to get – there's some bars I want to get. I want to get a safe, squat safety bar. And um, like a neutral grip bench thing. I got, you know, two squat racks. I got bands. I got chains. I got the, the, the bent benches. Uh, I got pretty much everything. Cool. Yeah, so I was telling you about that picture. So my favorite picture ever is the one my dad had taken. I was standing like this. Yeah. I had my jacket on. said Team USA. 
And then the guy standing right next to me had, you know, Team Russia on it. Yeah. It was like, my, my dad's like in the stand, took some pictures. I like, that's one of my coolest pictures ever. You know, like when, when can, you know, when, when it comes to sports, you know, politics don't play any roles in sports. You know, yeah. sports does not understand politics and, you know, different countries, you know, fighting against each other. When it comes to sports, everybody gets along good. You know, we had a bunch of guys from China at our world championships a couple of years ago. No problem with anybody. You know, everybody got along good. Everybody was doing photo ops and taking pictures with each other. It's like just tons of pictures with guys from other countries. You know, you see some guy walking by with a jacket from Australia. Hey, man, let's take a picture. Okay. You got your USA jacket on. They got their Ireland jacket on or Australia or Nauru and stuff, you know. And they were all nice people. Everybody's nice people. So it was kind of fun. It's, it's, it is one of those sports. Like, it's definitely one of those sports where, you know, you take just take the politics out, throw it out the window, and it's – People want to be friends. I got people from my ran as well that send me a lot of, um, they want to be chairman for us. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I would love, and, and they send me some really good qualifications, you know, and I tell them, I would love for you to be a chairman for us. But unfortunately, our countries do not get along well and it, it won't go well. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're never going to be able to come here. I'm never going to be able to go there. Yeah. You know, we're not going to be able to be at any of the same meets. So, you know, just, I don't know. I just don't know if it would ever work, but I've had, I've had that request like seven times over the years. What's it? I see a lot. I see the Ireland. Mm -hmm. ADAU, I see. On the Ireland one underneath ADAU, it's same, underneath um, 100% pro. It's the same thing like ADAU. There's another, it was ADFPA. Uh, IDFPA. So they used to, they used to be part of the WF, WDFPA. And then they didn't like the way they, they, that they run things. They, that's, you, you know, you have the you have the IPF and the WDF, PF. I think it was. I think that's what it is. World Drug Free Policy Federation. And they're they're a bunch of jerks. And the IDFPF. That was the affiliate. You know, the American affiliate is the ADFPF. You know, so every country has their same affiliate for that organization. But they are really. They're not very nice. You know, there's a certain guy over there that runs the thing and he's just not a real nice guy. And uh, it is what it is. And he, they've had a few countries drop out of them and come join us, which is great. So the the I, the Ireland chapter for 100% Raw was the IDFPF and they wanted to keep that recognition of their name. So it's 100% Raw, IDFPS. So yeah, Ireland Drug Free Policy Federation. All right. Uh, now we were talking about powerlifters, raw drug-free powerlifters having the same mindset. And I think if you train that way, you have a mindset that gets you through life's hardest moments. Have you found that your training has given you the mindset to get through tough moments in your life? You know, yes, it's, it's funny you say that because I I've had kids like I I've got, you know, my, my training at the school yeah. and I've got parents that have come to me, thanking me for some of the, you know, for their children and pushing them so hard because like a couple of the kids had told their parents, um, you know, if it wasn't for coach bossy's class, I would have never made it through boot camp. Yeah. You know, like boot camp was really tough, but it wasn't as tough as coach bossy's class, which, you know, it had prepared me for this. And like, I was sitting there, um, I had Wayne Claypatch and his wife had come down uh, from New York and they had got some things and we went out for dinner and um, I'm sitting in this woman staring at me at this restaurant and I'm like why does she keep staring at me and then when she got up she walked over to me when they were getting ready to leave she was like you coach bossy I'm like yes she's like I wanted to say thank you my son said if it wasn't for your class he would never pass boot camp you know, so that's my thing. I tell the kids, listen, guys, you know, life is full of peaks and valleys and there's a lot of obstacles on the way to the top. And I refer, I tell them this all the time. You just got to figure out how to get through them. You got to set goals and weightlifting is setting goals and being consistent and not and not giving up. You know, you're going to hit plateaus and you just got to sit there and fight through it and get your way to the top. Like you can be as good as you want and be as strong as you want and have anything in the world that you want. You just got to work for it. You know, and if you're willing to work for it, you can have anything. And I go, you know, I'm an example of that. I mean, I didn't have anything growing up. I'm not, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. You know, heck, I'm a physical education teacher. You know, and I'm, I'm doing pretty good for myself. So it's like, 
you know, you can do the same. You can do the same. You just got to work for it. You can, don't be afraid to work. You know, if you've got a job and you're not happy how much money you're making, well, you know, you don't quit because you don't like your job. You stay there and you look for something else. But you know what? Maybe you pick up another job or two jobs. And then the second job will give you that extra money that you want to live that way lifestyle that you want to live if you want a nice car or a nicer house or apartment or whatever it may be so yeah they definitely it definitely plays a huge role when in weight training by working and setting goals and just working through the you know the, the hard times because let's face it there ain't nothing harder than than doing a push to fill your set yeah does your wife lift <laughs> no no not really she uh She's tried it a couple of times, you know, just curling and stuff like that. I got uh, a special question for people whose who's, who's wives lift. I, I like to ask them if they could take advice from their wives. Lifting, <laughs> advice, lifting advice. It's, <laughs> taken me, it's taken me probably 20 years and some injuries to finally uh, start to realize I should probably listen to my wife a little bit. Oh, uh, that's too funny. Yeah, that's right. But you and her both lift together and compete, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a special thing. Like once I was uh I was squatting high. She was pregnant, I think, at the time, and she was like came down into the basement. And she's like, yeah, those are a little high. I was like, I know what depth is, get out of here. <laughs> and uh yeah, I bombed out of that that meat. <laughs> hey, even when the wife's not right, she's right. I bombed <laughs> yeah, happy, happy wife is a happy life. Um, when, when my- I was strict curling twice a week heavy. And she was like, yeah, you're going to give yourself bicep tendonitis. I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I gave myself bicep tendonitis. Yeah. Yep. What's the dumbest thing you've seen in a gym? Ooh, dumbest thing I've seen in the gym. Uh, I've seen a lot of dumb things. Um, gosh. Probably the dumbest thing I've seen is freaking guy squatting and at, tells his buddy to take, take, you know, oh, I, I, I can't get enough, take, take off a 45, take off a 45. So this guy takes it off on this side, you know, <laughs> and, th- and then it's going to go around to the other side and take it off the other side. And it went whoop at my gym. It goes in, in the bar, goes, hits the waist, goes through the window, shatters the window. My gym's on the second floor. All the glass comes flying down. I'm in West Virginia running a meet. And I get one of my, my members of my gym calls me up, Paul, I don't know what's going on, but I'm walking down the sidewalk to go into the gym and the window gets busted out and all the, you know, the glasses kind of flying down, almost hit me. And I'm like, what, what's going on? He's like, yeah. He goes, and then he's like, I see two guys running out right now. I got cameras in my gym. So it's like, it's not like, you know, so I pull up the camera and I'm, and I'm watching it. And I'm like, so I call the guy up, dude, what the blank are you just doing? Uh, uh, what are you talking about? Don't, don't play stupid with me. I'm looking at it right here on my camera on the phone. You're sitting there squatting on, on platform two right next to the window. You got your buddy take a weight of 45 off one side, and then the whole damn thing falls to the right, goes through the window, smashes my window, and then you run out of the gym. Get your ass back in there, clean up your damn weights, and freaking clean the glass off the sidewalk. Yes, sir. Sorry. You still talk okay. about clay patches? What's that? I haven't seen the clay patches in a long time. This still lifting? Yeah, well... I, I, uh, Wayne doesn't do nothing anymore. He just, he sold his weights. He sold everything. He's just like, he does nothing at all. He's just hibernation. And Hunter is going for his PhD. So he's down in Mexico. He was going Mexico and back to New York. And um, he's going, he's going to try to be an archaeologist. Really? And, uh, yeah, he's going for his PhD. So he's actually, I think he's finishing up his PhD this, this semester right now. I think he'll be a Dr. Claypatch right after this. Yeah, because they were around in the ADAU a lot. I saw them. Yeah, he, um, well, they, yeah, they did a little bit of ADAU, and then I don't know what happened, but then they came on board with 100% Raw and became very involved with 100% Raw. And honestly, Hunter Claypatch helped me a real lot. I mean, he was very integral part of of the growth of 100% Raw in in the early years. You know, he came on board. He He was young. You know, and you don't typically see young guys with that much energy and, you know, and he, he's not the most masculine fella in the world either, you know, but uh, I mean, I remember him lifting at 114 pound weight class, 
but he was strong for that, you know, for, for a yeah. guy at 114, 123. I mean, he had some records there. He, he was strong for a skinny guy. But um, anyhow, he, right around 2007, he, he came to me and says, you know, I want to help you out. I want to be more involved in the Federation. So he took over the records and upkeep of the records and all. And at that point there, and now Ed, Ed Kooten does it now, but Hunter played a big role from, from 2007 to about 2003. 14, 15, he played a big role in the Federation. And then um, and then he decided to go back into college. And he still helps. He still, he, he does uh, uh, drug testing updates and stuff. He takes all the drug testing, uh, the tests, and, uh, you know, puts them into the computer for the comprehensive drug tests and who failed and who didn't fail and whatnot. He works with Dr. Nick on that as far as um, keeping it all updated. But, um, you know, he'll probably get more involved once he... Um, finishes his degree that, that you know phd takes all your time i know my so. wife has a phd oh does she really in english yeah oh gosh okay you definitely need to listen to her yeah <laughs> it's a lot she's she, she's got a high school powerlifting team now oh really mm-hmm. oh wow island falls well the problem <laughs> she started the team like they like they just like were in the gym, just started lifting, mm-hmm. and they shut the gyms down with COVID. Ah. And so now, <laughs> she was doing basically Zoom lifting with them, just having them do core and stuff like that. You know, because mm-hmm. what else are we gonna do? At least do something. Right. Right. She had them doing push. Oh, she had push up contests with them on on the computer. And she, oh, cool. She was getting pretty creative. And now now they won't let them in. They have like a weight room and they have like the room with the machines. Yeah. They're letting them in the room with the machines. So she's doing that. You know, she's getting creative. She's doing it the best she can with what she's got. Right. Yeah. That's all you can do. Yeah. Well, good for her. That's awesome. Eventually, though, you'll see Highland Falls powerlifting team at high school at a, at a, at a competition. Now, where do, you, where do you guys live now? Orange County, New York. It's um, okay. like an hour north of the city. Okay. Good. So you're you're up there near um oh gosh my state chairman over there uh, he's in he's in um near Bingham Binghamton near near Clay Patches Owego Binghamton's yeah like like two hours away okay yeah like you would have to go like towards the city from Binghamton oh you no know. okay you know like you were like uh, right on the Hudson River like north of the city that's a nice area yeah it's it's nice. Plus, I mean, Jesus, I, the, uh, the, when we moved up here, the home prices were so low, you know, compared to when we were in Brooklyn. Yeah, New York house prices are crazy. Oh, my, my God. Yeah, we lived in a, uh, a two-bedroom condo that costs 100 grand more than our three-bedroom house on two acres. Oh, God. Nice. It's crazy. Good. That, was, that was definitely a good move right there. Have you ever bombed out of a meet? Oh, yes, I have. Terrible, Marvel. terrible. Oh my god! You know, it's like my first, the first minute I ever bombed out of, I was going to break the world record, and this was 1994. I was going to break the world record. I lived in Massachusetts, and we were going to uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. My dad was coming with me. I think it was my dad's first meeting he ever come to watch me at. And you know, I was going for like 465. Like that was, I think the record was 460. I think Dennis Cherry had the record, and I was going for 465 that day. So I'm opening up with four thirty-five, nothing. Three, three, de- three lifts, not one. That was my first bomb out ever, uh, and that was back in '94. And then in nine, in 2003, I went to a USAPL meet, and uh, that was 2003. I think it was 2003, and um, it might have been 2002. And I bombed out of that one. I, I, you know, I wasn't used to the commands. You know, they no pause command. So here I am waiting for the, I mean, the press command, I'm waiting for the press. Yeah. And there's no press. And finally, you know, like, obviously I can't get it. I'm waiting like five, six seconds. I'm like, you gotta be freaking kidding me. And then the next one, I just touch and go. And I was burnt out. So I messed that one up there. And then another USAPL one in 2006, that was here in Carolina. And um, I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with these guys. Yeah. Did you ever go to a meet with Brenda Siegel? When she was, yeah, yeah. not when she lifted, judging. Yeah, she, I don't, she never lifted. Okay, but 
Brenda Siegel is the toughest official in the world. She, oh my she God. Any baloney, man. On, on, the, on the bench press, she is legit by the book. That bar better not be moving before she gets a press signal. Yeah, she's an amazing judge. She really is. Yeah. She, she's a really, really good judge. Yeah. yeah she, she is. When she does the, the, the table and she does the microphone, oh, man, she lets you have it. When, when you don't get a lift, she's like, what were you thinking? Oh, <laughs> God, really? i never seen that part. Well, I mean, maybe because I've known her so long, like she's just like that meat I bombed out of. She was just like, she was like, what is wrong with you? Just go deeper. <laughs> nice. Yeah. She Tell was, it how it is. Tell it how it is. Um, you're an old school lifter. What's your view on mirrors and music in the gym? Um, well, when I was younger, I was like any other kid looking in the mirror. You know, get all pumped up, go do another set of triceps, go do another set of biceps, look at the mirror, you know, you know, I did all that. Now, I, I, I give two craps, you know, like, like now, like my gym has mirrors, but they, there was, mirror, you know, I think mirrors make the gym look prettier, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And then, you know, let's face it, people want to look at themselves in the mirror. Now, my high school gym, we don't have a mirror in the gym at all, not one mirror in the whole gym. And, you know, we're there to work. You know, you have my football team, my wrestling team. I'm there to push you guys. We're going to hit a work. That's it. Uh, but at a regular gym that people are paying to come to, like my fitness warehouse gym, yeah, we have mirrors all the way around. And, you know, you got to have them. I mean, people people like people like to look, and they, they want to look at themselves. You know, they want to see how the pump's looking. And, and it's motivating. I mean, I know, you know, not, these days I don't – I don't do it no more, but, but, but back in the day, I would pump up and look at the side and be like, wow, I'm getting bigger. And like, it was, so it motivated me to do another set, another set, you know, whatnot. Um, as far as music. Yep. I, again, I love the music in the gym. I mean, now everybody's got pods, you know what I'm saying? So you put the ear pods in, you get your own music and listen to it and it, you know, do your own thing. Um, there's a gym up in Virginia and uh, gosh, what the heck's the name of it? I think it's called the Iron Gym, Iron Salem, Iron Gym. I think it's called the Iron Gym. And it's like, it's almost like a nightclub. It's it's in an old warehouse, okay? So you, you know how you pull up to a commercial places, uh, gosh, the commercial uh, parks, you know, we got business commercial parks. Yeah. You know, you pull up and you get, you know, you got buildings there and, you, you know, you got the front offices here and in the back, you got the warehouse. So that's what it is. It's in an old commercial business park, okay? And in the front of the offices, you know, it's all low, one level. And you see all offices in the front. And then in the back, it's got this big warehouse. And once you step through that door to go into the back, they've got music cranking, okay? It's everything's painted black. All the walls are black. The ceiling's black. They got low lights and they got some colored lights up there. So it's like, there's some like purplish lights and stuff. And it's like, but the lighting is really low. Okay, they got their mirrors on the walls and everything, and the music that they're playing. Like I can't say the words here, you know, I don't know if kids are going to be listening to it. So, you know, I I know the owner. I, I don't I don't know him great. My buddy knows him really good, my buddy Pat. But you know, the guy's motto is: if you sit there and complain about the music, he tells you to get the blank out. You know, if you don't like my music, don't come. Like I don't care. And they got that music blaring, and I don't have a problem with it. I I'm fine with it. You know, but. As a business owner and as a gym owner, I leave mine on a regular, you know, modern music pop station on the, you know, because I, I can't, I got to think about the families. I got to think about the older people. I, I don't want to sit there as a business owner. I have to appease everybody to keep them in there, you know, and my best customers are the older people, the people that are, you know, 45 and above, you know, that, that can exercising is a way of their life. You know, I got a lot of people in their sixties and seventies and I got a couple in their eighties in my gym that exercise is a way of their life and they don't want to come in and listen to that mess, you know? So I just keep one station on at my gym and I keep it at a certain level, just enough to have a little bit of noise. It's funny because every once in a while, like the power will go out, you know, the power will flick. And so the, the radio will shut off and it doesn't come back on. I have to manually put, plug it on. And when I go upstairs and the music's not playing, it's really eerie in there. Like, it's like, oh my God, like, it's terrible. Like, you've got to have music just to give a little background, just a little something. But so I keep it at a certain level. Now, 
when we do our powerlifting thing, like on Sunday mornings, we don't have a lot of people in my gym on Sunday mornings. So I'll put my 80s rock in there and stuff, 70s and 80s rock, you know, put some Steve Miller in there and we'll, we'll crank it up, you know. And then if some people, you know, if customers come in, I'll walk over to my customer and I'll say, hey, listen, are you, are you okay with the music this loud? If you want, I'll lower it. You know, sometimes they'll say, yeah, if you can lower it a little bit. And sometimes they, you know, oh, no, no, that's fine. I like this stuff. You know, there's a lot of the people are from that 70s and 80s section and they like that music. So Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays when we're training, I'll put 70s and 80s in there. I'll play rock. And um, again, there's no cussing. Like the, the music today, everything's cussing. Yeah. But, you know, I don't want any of that in my gym. I just, just like I said, as a business owner. Now, if I had something like you have here, you know, home gym stuff and, you know, people are coming over to lift with you, you could crank up whatever you want to crank up and do whatever you want. And that's awesome. But it's motivating. I mean, I'll tell you right now, my buddy, Tony, uh, Tony Huffman, he's a, he's, he's a curl. He's got a couple of world records in the curl now. And he's, he's really big into the curl and um, in his house, in his, he's, he's got this beautiful, beautiful house. He's got this, uh, he, he's got a curl platform. One of my, my chairman from, Kentucky went out of business last year with COVID. So Tony had bought his curl platform and he's got it right in one of his dining room dens. I guess it would be the den. He's got it right in the middle of the den. He's got his curl platform. He's got his weight rack and he just does his curling right there. So all summer long, I was going up there last year when COVID hit and, you know, we couldn't have the gym open and stuff, even though we still went in, you know, I went, I went in to clean my gym, you know, but we, on Wednesday nights, we'd go up there with Tony's. We'd, we'd, we'd curl, and his wife would go out and get us pizza. And uh, we and we would crank it up. And certain, you know, like I play my favorite songs when I'm lifting. He plays his favorite when it's his turn. And then, you know, the other guys, that we had a few other friends that would come up with us. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely is motivating. It definitely pulls up, definitely brings some endorphins out of your body to lift more weight. Uh, on the, you talked about appeasing your customers. How bad do you hate CrossFit? You know, I, I don't hate CrossFit. You know, it's uh, CrossFit, believe it or not, has helped female powerlifting go through the roof. Okay. And listen, if you want to go out and get be weak, that's fine with me. I don't have no problem with that. You know what I'm saying? CrossFit for guys, guys that CrossFit are weak. They're not strong. Okay, you got you got the guys on TV that you see on ESPN doing the championships. That's the best of the best of the best. Okay, and yes, they look like a, the best bodies you go, and they're very endurance, but they cannot compete against a powerlifter. Okay, there's just no way they cannot compete against a powerlifter. Guys that CrossFit when they try to do powerlifting, and again, this isn't every single person, but there's exceptions. But there's guys what I've seen. We don't have any guy crossfitters powerlifting because the guy crossfitters get weak. I had a bunch of my football plays when they right after football season, they decided they want to get into CrossFit and they were seniors and stuff. Yeah, they lost a lot of weight and they trimmed down, they looked really good, but they were weak. You know, yeah, they could do pull-ups and they could do other body exercises, but they couldn't squat, they couldn't bench, they couldn't deadlift, they couldn't curl. Okay. Now, on the other hand, female crossfitters have lit up the world of powerlifting. They have smashed every record there is. And for whatever reason, women that CrossFit get really strong and do really well in powerlifting. And, and how did, we used to have, at our world championships around 2010, nine and before, we'd have like 10 to 12 females for, for powerlifting at the Worlds. So on Friday, we'd have the females and the lightweight men up to like 165, yeah. okay? And then, um, and then it got to the point around 2013, we had the females by themselves because we had like 45 females only. And then it grew and like every year it kept growing because all these girls that CrossFit started doing powerlift. Like, hey, we're already squatting. We're already deadlifting. We're already benching. Like, what the hell? Let's not do it. You know, they got, they got, you know, they got meets where they got records and stuff like that. I could break these records here. I'm going to go. And before you know, we were getting 90 women at the world championship. The, the women's division grew in seven years, grew to be the largest division that we have over the men. And they're, and they're smashing the records. So yes, I, I, I actually enjoy the fact of the, the CrossFit. Yeah. You know, we've had two CrossFit gyms come to Elizabeth city where my gym is. Neither one of them had made it. One lasted a year. The other one lasted like three months. I've heard, yeah, I've heard similar stories from gym owners, Olymp, like um, I spoke with uh, Jim Schmitz. He's uh, the coach of the 
uh, the of, of the Olympic powerlifting, you know, uh, a few times in the Olympics. He has a gym out in San Francisco where he coaches Olympic lifting. Yeah. And he says if it wasn't for CrossFit, that gym wouldn't be there anymore because it's all it's people that did CrossFit and they, I guess, you know, didn't do that good with the Olympic lifting side of it. They wanted to learn more. So they went to the source, you know, They and it's the same thing with powerlifting, you know, right. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of powerlifting focused gyms that like they're getting CrossFitters that want to get strong. Right. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely helped, you know, and same thing with, kind of same thing with Planet Fitness. Planet yeah. Fitness came to my town and Planet Fitness kind of killed my gym back in 2015 when it came. Yeah. And they took a bunch of my members, but you know, we had built back up to where we were or pretty close to where we were. And the fact that Planet Fitness is, is luring people in for $10 a month, people will try the gym. Yeah. You know, for we, we charge $34.95 a month. People are like, yeah, it's $34.95. So they go into Planet Fitness, they get in a taste for it. But now they want more because their crowbars only go to 60 pounds. Their demos only go to 70 pounds. Yeah. You know, our crowbars, you know, we got our vocal bars. You can go up to 300 pounds if you want. And we got dumbbells up to 150. So they, you know, they will uh, go over there and then they'll make some gain stuff. And they want to continue, but they're not making any more gains. They got stuck. So they oh, we'll go to play the fit, uh, go to uh, fitness warehouse. So they leave Planet fitness, go to fitness warehouse. So they're helping us as well. You know, they, they're training people and getting people started at a low rate. And they come over to us and same thing with CrossFit. They're getting people started. And then people are like, you know what? I'm just going to go into powerless instead. So you got uh, chains stocked in uh, your gym. I've got a set of chains uh, at my school. I got six sets of chains at my, at my gym. I only got one set. I'm going to, I need to get a couple more sets. Well, I found that, well, I got, you know, my, my, I guess the set, the two of them together on each side is a hundred pounds, 102 pounds. But I find that's like, a, a, that's worked for me. Like that's a good, good number. Mm -hmm. Like in like poundage wise, it's, it seems to, to work well. Yeah. The ones I have at my gym right now, I think they're, they're uh, 35 each. So there's 70 pounds total. And um, I have like just a giant mop full of like chains I found places. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. I got, oh. this, this is like, you know, I, I adjust it with that. And then it has just all different size chains. Yeah. It works as 51 pounds each. Nice. That's a good idea. I like the way you did that. That's a whole lot. That's actually smart. Oh, you know what everyone's telling me that I did was smart. Actually, uh, finally, once in my life, I did a smart thing. My, uh, my, my son is uh, deadlifting. He's nine years old. Got a problem keeping his back straight, right? He's either like hyperextending or like ar arching his back. And but sometimes he's hitting it straight. So like he's got the strength to do it. Right. And I have him doing nothing. That. He's working on like 33 pounds. It's nothing for him. So normally, like, I would never have, like, a mirror in front of someone to lift. But, like, he's so young and, like, he just, like, doesn't know, like, where his body is. So I have the laptop in front of him, the camera, the phone on the side, and I do, like, a Zoom call so he could see himself sideways live. Oh, wow. And let me tell you, his back is rock solid straight now. That's cool. That's a really good idea. Yeah, it's the only good idea I've ever had. So I'm letting everybody know. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a really good one. That's freaking awesome. So 100% raw. What are the goals? Hmm, our goals. Our goals. Well, obviously, to be the best pilot of federation in the world. That's you know, that's our number one goal. Uh, one day, my dream has been to have a professional division. And you know, we when we started 100 raw. Well, when I started 100 raw, uh, pilot of federation. My, my goal was one day to, you know, try to get this thing to where it's kind of like the UFC, you know, I want to get it where it's, you know, we, we have pay-per-view and we have, you know, you know, championships and you get, you know, the top five guys, you know, are there and have different weight classes that each of those nights and just do like a pay-per-view thing, have a professional division where we are the go-to drug-free organization, you know, and I feel 
lifters go where the money is. Yeah. And all the people that have done professional things in the past never drug never did drug testing. Okay. So, oh well, hey, game on. You know what I'm saying? If you're not gonna I, th- I feel that if you do drug free, if you can come up with the same product and go drug free, that the lifters are going to want to be there. If I, if I had a $25,000 championship for the number one venture, you know, in each weight class, you yeah. win the championship, you get 25,000, but it's drug free. You're not going to get tested. Okay. You're going to get tested prior to coming because if you fail the test, then you obviously I'm not even letting you come. And then you get tested at the meet as well. You know, you're, you're going to, you're going to be clean. I mean, $25,000 is a lot of money. To, to win now obviously i don't have that kind of money to give out and all and you know we're still we're still growing the brand but you know you, you know you gotta you gotta know some people that you know know how to get around and do things and how to you know get it to the where television is like you know one of my goals was to at one point i want to i want to do like a reality show i want to do 100 percent raw reality show where we have you know 10 or 12 characters around the world and we're filming them, you know, and you have a reality show where you have, you have somebody in China, somebody in, in uh, Ukraine, somebody in Russia, somebody in Italy, somebody in Ireland, somebody in U.S., somebody in Canada, you know, maybe somebody in Nauru. You know, they, they when they come down, they're, they're strong. That little, little, it's 10 square miles. It's a, it's a dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But powerlifting is their national sport. And they came to the World Championships and they won it a couple of years ago. What country? Uh, it, it's called Nauru. Nauru? Yeah. N-A-U-R-U. I think it's east of Papua New Guinea. I think it might be on the same island as Papua New Guinea. I think it's only 10 square miles. Right. They're uh their their claim to fame is phosphate. They 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 have big phosphate mines there. Yeah. Um so you know, my, my that's again yeah, like I've got these goals. You know, we need to build the brand more, we need to get more members, we need to, you know, get more countries involved, fully active. And once we can get it to that point there, you know, obviously, hopefully I can meet the right people that know how to bring it to that next level, you know, and you know, like Marcus Lamanis, you know, hey, I need to make friends with Marcus Lamanis and say, okay, Marcus, I, I got a brand for you, you know, the Fertitta brothers. Well, I mean, I think you're doing pretty good. I think from what I see, it's grow- it seems like it's growing and raw i think you, you you got lucky not you got lucky but i mean all these ex crossfit people don't want to lift with you know multiply suits they want to lift raw right so all these people coming into it want to lift raw so we've gotten we've gotten lucky on that end but the organization is good too so you know, it's not just like only because you got lucky. I think, you know, the 100% was well, a good organization. Um, well, I think there's no way you're not going to grow. I, I, I think we're going to keep growing. The strict curl, I think, is a, is a big part of it. I think include start letting that in was, a, I don't know whoever the idea was that or to finally let that in, to let that in. Or I think that that's a great idea. Um, I think uh, my my opinion, I talk to a lot of people from all over the world doing this. Everyone, when I mention the overhead press, they get super excited. They're like, really? Oh. Well, I, I didn't hear that one. The, the overhead press is would be my only, like, that's my opinion on, like, what would help boost the organization a little more. I, I like a, a lot of people want to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that from you because I haven't heard, you know, from a lot of people on it. So to hear you say that, to hear you, you know, like it and say that other people like it, that's good to know. Because we, I kind of tabled it. You know, we had that conversation about five, six months ago and a couple of my people are on there and they're kind of going at each other on it. And I'm like, you know, it's kind of a mute issue right now because the fact that, you know, we're in COVID and we're not going anywhere anyways. We're like treading in, in quicksand, you know? So let's, let's, let's table it, but we can talk behind the scenes. We don't need to put stuff out there on, on you know, on, the, on Facebook and let people see, you know, different views. Let, let's talk about it in the background and let's see what we can do. And I, I think I, I can see it coming as a pilot thing where different meat directors can try it if they want, you know? 
but these are the rules that we're going to have. If you're going to do it, you're going to follow these rules. And, and then and see how it grows, you know, like the curl. When we first started the curl in 2007, um, so we had it, John Shiflett was doing it and Brett Kernoff was doing it in Vermont. And I ran my first one that year. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, hell no. This ain't, we're not doing this. Yeah. Guys, you know, we had a freestanding. So you grabbed it off the rack. It was freestanding. Curl. You know, I was like, yeah. Yeah, power. No. Yeah, power. Yeah, power. yeah, yeah. It was like, it was too subjective, you know? Yeah. Like, just wait. You, you got to have more concrete, you know, um, rules than, than sit there. Like, you know, if, how do we know how much of a, a swing back was? It's just too much momentum. That's what I said. If we're going to do this, we're going to do it in, you know, with, with a platform. We'll have to have a, a wall, back wall, put in a platform, and just go from there. And I uh, had one made. And we started that in 2008, and, and it kicked off. Obviously, it paid dividends. The overhead press could be another one that works well. Um, but, again, I agree with you 100%. If you're going to do it, you got to do it on a Friday night. You can't do that on a, on a Saturday. Because the When Saturday meet ends, it has to end with you know with a deadlift. Now, yeah. granted, not, a, not everybody has the opportunity to run a curl on a Friday night. So, you know, if you got to run it on Saturday afterwards, you do. Our rules stay that it's going to be the last lift if you do it on Saturday. How is how is Ed Cooten doing it? Because I know he's not doing it on um, on the Sabbath. Yeah, right. He wouldn't do it on Saturdays. Um, exactly. So he he'll do his. It'll be the last lift of that day. So it's, it is going to be after the deadlift. Yeah, it'll be after the deadlift. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All my arms are going to be sore. You know, tired after the deadlift. Yeah. I like Friday. Night. I like. I really. I really do like. Like if it's a Friday Saturday meet. I really like going out to the meet, doing the early weigh-ins, and then you go do your strict curl. It's it's fun. Uh, the strict curl is not a stressful event, and everyone says this, right? Because this is why, right? If you have like a single lift, if you had a single lift meet that you could do the squat, bench, or deadlift, you're gonna have probably two people do the squat. You know what I mean? Twenty people bench and and you know fifteen people deadlift. Because you, you're going to have people do the least, the, the less stressful lift. Am I right? The, the squat, people, is, people are scared of the squat. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the one. That's the hardest one. I mean, that's, that, that's the worst one. That, you know, it's hard to judge. It's hard to spot. It's hard to lift. Yeah. Yeah. For, 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 for lifters, you know, most lifters would rather bench and deadlift and strict curl. People, you know, people want to avoid the squat. Yep. In my mind... <laughs> I don't want to, I'm not going to say what I think of them because I'm going to try and be nice. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, I started squat, I started powerlifting a long time ago. So to me, it's a squat bench and deadlift. The strict curl is just a fun extra thing to do. You know? Exactly. Well, that, you, you, so many people, so many of the old school hardcore powerlifters do not like the curl. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, but, but more people are coming on to like it as a fun lift. You're it's right. like, it's like, it's a fun thing to do. It's, it's, it, listen, it's not a power lift. It's, it, you know, power lifting never involved curl, but the curl is a weightlifting exercise and you can't deny that it is a weightlifting exercise and also helps. I mean, it helps you stabilize on the bench press as well. Okay. There's no denying the fact that it is a lift. Okay. It's not a power lift, but it is a lift. Yeah. Okay. And when you do it on a Friday night, it's, it's a lot of fun because for a meat director as well, because if the curl, if you got something going on, like your computer's not going right or the lights ain't working right, you know, now like Friday night, you can get it set up for set. You can fix it for Saturday morning, you know? Um, and you can still keep that meat going while you're trying to fix the lights or whatever, or the computer program, whatnot. And, and no, no strict, no one doing the strict curl is going to freak out on you too. Like, you yeah. know, like, uh, you know, like, like a, you know, like a, you know, deadlift, you know, like, like someone yeah. like 30 10 deadlift. Yep. And, and as far as spotters go, you don't need really, you don't, there is no spotters. Yeah. You only have, you only have loaders. That's it. Just a loader. Okay. And, um, and anybody can load. I mean, the heaviest thing you're going to load is a 25 kilo plate. That's yeah, everything you're going to load. Realistically, you can load the bar. You could just have them load it themselves. Hey, hey, honestly, it's, you probably could. It's so little. As long as you have the officials watching and making sure they're loading the right way, like yeah, 
Not a I big mean, if, if you had to, you could have your two side officials loaded. You know what I'm saying? If yeah. you really had to, I mean, you know, but it's 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 a very easy lift to put on and to have fun, and people really enjoy it. Yeah. You know? And now, and now, I mean, it has grown so much. I mean, we've got people coming from all over the country just to curl. People flying in from across the country to curl. That's it. I see people that see me do it on Instagram, like really like a couple of, like a year or so ago, like now I see them like up against a wall in their gym. Like, what do I have to do? Just keep my butt and shoulders on the wall. And they're not powerlifters. You know what I mean? They're just yeah. like, it. but you know, people, they're not, they're not intimidated by a curl. Well, and that, that's the thing. Anybody can do a curl. Everybody does curl. Curls like bench press. Yeah. Everybody in the gym curls. Right. You know, so anybody can curl and you know, it's just like, hey, I could do this. I could do this. Why not? You know, why not give it a try? I could do this. But yeah, just my humble opinion. I I I think the the overhead press people would be super excited about. Okay, well that's good to know. We uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to work work on that behind the scenes and see if we can get some you know, get it approved and then maybe run it. I mean, yeah. I know you drive Ed Coot nuts writing up the rules for that one. He he does. He's not happy about it. And, and, um. Herb already got the overhead rules written. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, may, we may have to tweak them a little bit, but but I mean, he's already got everything written up, but he sent it to me and all. So, yeah, we may have to look at it, you know. And, and again, when you do it as a pilot for the first year, you do it as a pilot, you see how you like it, you know. And ideally, the way that Herb already has it done, it, which would be the easiest way and the least expensive way, because you're using your, your squat rack already. So, you walk up to the squat rack, you got the weight there. You know, you just gotta make sure there's no, you know, and yeah, cheating with the legs. I mean, he, he they got stiff legs. What about seated? Well, that's that's I think seated would probably be more of a strict press, strict overhead press. Yeah. But that brings in another piece of equipment. You know what I'm saying? The bench. Well, I guess you could do like that. You you could sit right on the bench, bring it off here, seat it. I guess you could do that. You just keep your butt on the bench. Yeah. Yeah. I just wrote the new rules for you. There, there you go. Yeah, hey, appreciate that. <laughs> well, Mr. Bossy, uh, thank you so much for setting the record clear on when raw lifting started and how it started and, uh, and, and your history and your team's history and your football coaching career and all this stuff. It's, uh, I, I want to know all this stuff about you. you know, I've heard a lot about you. Uh, ho- hopefully some of it was good. Yeah, a lot of it was good. <laughs> thanks a lot for uh playing right. along. Right. well thank thank you for being part of 100 percent raw you know thank you for your your interest and your support over the years and stuff and your continued support you know oh, you brought okay. brian in that's good keep 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 recruiting new uh, uh meet directors and chairman for me i will and you know me and my wife have been recently talking that we you know we've been in this sport for for so long and uh it's, it's time to put on a meet so it would you know, we'll, I'll be in touch with you and we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. Awesome. 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 Great. All right. Take, take, take care. Goodbye. Tell your wife I said hello. I will. Bye. All right.